let's get out the study guide that I've named it up. And let's um I'm not in the shot. I'd like to begin with just some general observations. So um, if you don't remember, then open your Bibles to John chapter <coughs> 1, verses 1 through 18. If you don't remember what's there, put your finger there. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Uh, you might be flipping back and forth. But uh, we want to ponder the theology that comes into view when we look at all of these things that I have listed in lines two through four. Um, let's begin with uh, line three. Uh, these events that surround the birth of Christ. Um, I name uh, the principles. Who are Zacharias and Elizabeth? Okay, they're the parents of John the Baptist. Who is Simeon? He's a priest. He's the priest, according to, yes, and uh, when, uh, according to the, uh, the book of James, not, not the canonical book, but the, it's called the Port Evangelium of James, or also called the story of Mary's birth, or the book of James, because it's purportedly written by James, the brother of the Lord. Um, Zacharias was killed by Herod's soldiers because he would not divulge the whereabouts of John the Baptist when he was an infant. Uh, the, uh, Simeon was, was, uh, was, put in his, was elected to the office of high priest in his place. The significance of Simeon um, is that he is the one who translated uh, Isaiah when the 70 elders were commissioned by, I can't even remember now who it was that commissioned them, to translate the uh, Hebrew Bible into Greek for the Library of Alexandria. It was his, it was his portion to translate Isaiah. Now, this is what, the second or third century BC. So he comes to Isaiah 714, comes to the Hebrew word Alma, which means virgin or it means a young maid. It could mean either one. And uh, he was contemplating, he was, he was, was uh, studying, how am I going to translate this into Greek? And he started to translate it as a uh, young, young woman. But an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, no, it is to be translated as virgin. And so he translated it as virgin. And then uh, to, uh, he, was a, he was a holy man to begin with. But to uh, confirm that this was the right translation, the old angel told him that he would not die until he saw the fulfillment of that prophecy. So this is the backstory, if you will, of uh, the Lord being brought into the temple by his parents. What was it? The 40th day, um, and Simeon takes him into his hand, his arms, which evokes the image of Isaiah chapter six. Uh, where Isaiah is, um, sees the Lord in, in high and lifted up on a slab of sapphire. Interesting, all these visions of the Lord in the Old Testament. So many of them have this uh, sapphires underneath them. of a firmament in a, in a, in a, like, a, like a sapphire, like a sapphire, a shiny sapphire uh, slab or whatever. Um, sapphire is the color blue which we associate with the Virgin Temple. So uh, Isaiah saw him and he, uh, with the angel, remember, took the coals from the fire and uh, placed them on Isaiah's lips. So this is the image that is evoked when the Theotokos takes the Christ child from the fiery light of the Lord and puts him into the arms of Simeon, uh, like, a, like the tongs, like the coal of fire has been placed in the arms of, Simeon, of, of Isaiah. And so now, now the, the words of Isaiah begin to make more sense to you, do they not? Now let us thou by servant depart in peace, for my eyes have seen. Um, when my eyes have seen uh, thy salvation, which thou shalt be buried before the face of all people, the light and light of the Gentiles, the Lord that is Israel. So um, 
That's Simeon. And then Anna, who was also a prophetess, who was also in, that, in the temple of that day when, when the Lord was brought into the temple. And the, um, I, this, the insight that I want to share with you here from lines 2 through 5 um, actually comes from my wife. Um, Remember that all of these people um, were filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, so the Holy Spirit is like, you know, he's, 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 he's everywhere at this time. He's just, he's, you see all these holy people. Um, Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesies a beautiful prayer uh, recorded in Luke chapter, what is it, Luke chapter 1, and then um, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and, in, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, she breaks out into this beautiful thing. Um, when John the Baptist, when, when Mary, now that, now, uh, now that she has the, the, Jesus conceived in her womb, comes to visit Elizabeth, you remember now, that John the Baptist, in the womb of Mary, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, leaps in Mary's womb, because he recognizes the Lord in Mary's, in Mary's womb. And what does Elizabeth say? Behold the mother of my Lord. So there's the first, the first uh, time that Mary is called Theotokos, the mother of God, the mother of my Lord. And then you remember that and then Simeon, of course, is filled with the Holy Spirit, and Anna the prophetess, is filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, so we have the Holy Spirit all over the place. And um, with that, we let, uh, either look at John chapter 1, verses 1 from 18, but in particular I think in verse 9. And uh, let, you know, let's just, just uh, sit down. Let's start, you know. Start the naming some. Who is this? Who is this Jesus Christ that is in the womb of Mary? Okay, well, when you get the right one, you stop. So, but uh, let's just start um, listing some of the other, uh, what, what we call the attributes, but the, the, the descriptions of Christ's identity. Start, start listing them. The word. The word is the word. Okay, hang on, hang on. I want to put the bar. That's the Hebrew for word to word. And the reason I want to put that down is because the bar is uh, it's, it's Hebrew technology. Uh, refers to what's in the back. You know, the back. <coughs> which is significant, which is, which is meaningful because uh, when it's referred, when it's a uh, reference to issues of, of ultimate reality um, is what's in the back specifically of the temple. So what's at the very back? The sanctuary. Now the sanctuary in the temple is the place, let's see if we can, here we'll just draw here, here's the sanctuary, and those will just make this the temple. So here's the, the sanctuary, the holy of holies. Um, We'll put the altar there, we'll put the tree of life in the menorah, which represents the tree of life, and there's the children there. But the, the sanctuary, the holy people, this is the place where creation meets and opens out onto the uncreated, or the human you know, And so the Dabar is standing in the very back um, of the sanctuary, which means that the Dabar of God is, is right there at the point where the earth opens out into heaven. So he's the divine, he's the word of God, so he's the, the beginning. He's the beginning, he's also the end. As he said in Revelation, I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Uh, but that's not exactly the word that I want. I mean, that word, you'll see, I think, that that word does work. I mean, that this, this descriptive uh, label of Christ does work, and, and it, does, it does enhance our, under, our theological vision I think presented here just in the uh, in the, in the uh, mystery of, of, the, of the events surrounding Christ's birth. But so, what are some other terms that uh, Christ is that we say Christ is from John chapter one, verses one to fifteen? Okay. Yeah. 
There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Light. Light. And with light comes what? It's the light. He, what does it say? He was the light of men, and in, in whom was the life of men? Or, I always get those two back, work mixed up. Is it the light? In whom was the light of men? Or is he the light of men? In whom was the life of men? But anyway, it's light and life. So with that, okay, keep in mind now, put them together. So what we have so far, we have the Holy Spirit you know, filling all of these people, Zacharias, Elizabeth, Virgin, uh, Simeon, and Anna, they're in, uh, I'm thinking it's the environs of Jerusalem or whatever, in Palestine. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 1, 1 to 3. What do we read? And see if you can see the connection. And if you can, draw it out for us. But how does Genesis 1, 1 to 3 play into this vision of the Describing up here is this, as Jesus Christ, the light of God coming into the world. Well, it's, it's the first thing God says, for one thing, and the first thing He says is, "Let there be light." Okay, He says, "Let there be light." But even before that, what even before that? What's going on? The Spirit is. The Spirit is brooding over the face of the waters, and out of the Spirit's brooding, He says, "Let there be." What does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now here's where, here's where our debar comes into play. In the beginning, at the back of the sanctuary, where creation absolutely begins from out of the mystery. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning, God said, he spoke his word. Um, and the word of the the Spirit is brooding over the face of the waters. God said, let there be light. So, show us how Genesis 1, 1 to 3 is, if you will, in the background, if it's not the stage of all that's happening surrounding Christ's birth. What do you see? Christ is the light of God. Coming from the womb of a virgin, the living temple, overshadowed by the Spirit. If you were to put this uh, and, and juxtapose it to Genesis 1, 1 to 3, what would you what would be the course what would correspond to the virgin? Or even what would correspond to um, Zacharias, Elizabeth, Simeon, Anna? What will correspond to them in Genesis 1, 1 to 3? Virgin annunciation, which she's overshadowed. Yes, but in Genesis 1, 1 to 3, what would that all correspond to? Spirit. Well, the Spirit is overshadowing them. But the water. Yes. Is the form of some empty yes, spot. the waters. They are the waters. Uh, the Spirit is, is brooding. So then, the uh, what 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 does Christ then correspond to? That should be easy. From Genesis one, one the statement, God. Or but, but or right. the light. Let there be light. So um, can you see then that the, the the story of Christ's birth, as it is given, especially in Luke, because Luke is the one who's drawing this with this out more than Matthew is. Elizabeth, Zacharias, John the Baptist, Simeon, and uh, they're all like the earth. They're the waters um, over which the Spirit is, is, is brooding. And they're all bearing witness to Christ. Right? The light who is conceived in the womb of the Virgin and is going to come forth from the Virgin. Now, what theology does that spark? Or is that, does that create in your mind. What can you see? There's something to think about, and I'll share with you what I see. And I realize it's a big question to throw on all at once. Um, but this is what I see. You can go home, you can think about it some more. Um, it says what? Um, that, you know, that God created the heavens by His Word and by His Spirit. 
So we don't see the word in the spirit. Well, this, the, the word of God, by which he creates the creation, the heavens and the earth, is the image of God, right? And the spirit is, you might say, the likeness of God. Okay, but the spirit is what, is what makes it all alive. So if creation comes into being through the image of God, through his spirit, you tell me, how is it possible for heaven and earth not to show the character and the structure of the word of God and the spirit? And in fact, one of the uh, oft used um, and favorite, favorite words of both scripture and the Holy Fathers, especially the early Holy Fathers, are the words that have to do with stamp and impress, or typos and anti -tipos. Um, so the, the, the stamp, or going back to what we were talking about a few weeks ago on, uh, from Exodus chapter 25, verses 9 and 40, the heavenly pattern, the stamp <coughs> is God's word in his Holy Spirit. And the impress, what's being impressed, is heaven and earth. So that means that the whole of heaven and earth has this, it, it, it comes into being stamped by or impressed by the stamp of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But now can you not also see how, if that's the case, then um, would the incarnation of, of God from the Virgin, as much as we have just seen how it is, uh, um, it, how it corresponds, I would say, perfectly, Genesis 1, 1 to 3, can you not see how the incarnation of God's word? Well, I'll, you know, I'll ask you a question that you know, I'll, I'll put on the oven. A duh question. Um, is the, um, and what was it? I just lost it. Um, is, the, is the creation, is, is the incarnation of God an accident? No. It's written into the very structure of the creation. So God want us to see. So then what was the very first prophetic act of God that prophesied the mystery of Christ? Or could prophesy the mystery of Christmas? Creation itself. Creation itself. Creation itself. So um, this, you know, so now we're we're kind of in the in the in the, in the setting now of Christmas. It's not just this. This, this fun event, you know, of presents around the tree, we, we ooh and all oh, this cuddly little baby, sweet, precious, you know. No, this is, this, this is scary. So that the angel has to say to the shepherd, don't be afraid. This is, this is the very meaning of your, of creation, the very meaning of you. Christ and Christ God in the flesh, Christmas. The creation is about to be finished. That's what was prophesied even in Genesis 1, 1 to 3. There it is, being fulfilled. Um, all right. Questions, comments? Don't be afraid to, to jump in, you know. Yes, Moment? Now, when you were talking about uh, Gilman John talking about the term life, mm -hmm. and then going back to Genesis. The Greek that, uh, like, I've heard before in the Greek that there's like a play on of words sometimes with the root phos, which is sometimes used for man. Uh, do you think that's connected at all? No, I don't, I don't know about that connection. However, the word phos is surprisingly um, everywhere. Um, so uh, that would be something interesting to look into. Um, Brad, you had your hand up. Well, I, th I heard um, the this from the beginning that this shows us who we are. There's there's a teaching I don't know that this refutes, and I'm wondering if when you said about it being an accident, so there's a in terms of Christ coming. 
there's a doctrine because of the fall oh, he sure. came. Mm -hmm. Instead of he was coming, yes. that was the plan in the first that was place. Plan A. Yep. Exactly. So this that's, is not plan B. Right. So he didn't Yes. So I was just trying to see the two, how to explain both and how that one is the one that we're talking about is Let's run with that brand. refutes the fact yes, that yep. it's plan B. And if it's plan A, if this is what it was what creation was intended for from the beginning, well what does that say about what we're made for? What does it say? Yes. But, but I'm curious then on Brad's point. Then with Jesus dying, that's plan A. No, no, no. Well, okay, now now we start to get it. <laughs> I would say that's plan A, modified. Um, here's where I, in my effort to, to <coughs> what I see is that God, and, you know, he but when he creates the creation, heaven and earth, that is a form of dying. That is to say, he's coming out of himself. And that's what dying is, coming out of himself. But in those terms, you see that dying is but the incarnation, if you will, the concretization, concretization of, of love. So God comes out of himself, and the intention was that man would come out of himself. And in that place where they come out of themselves and meet, they become one. So as a result of this fall, the fall, this, this is the movement of Eros, by the way, right? You can see the movement of Eros. So as a result of the fall, when man takes his Eros and empties it out onto himself, now you can see where we accept that death for us. And, and we, we said this, what, I don't remember how long ago, about a few months ago. We suggested that death is our experience of eros perverted and corrupted. Um, so, when Christ dies on the cross, well, he had already started dying. You could say, when he emptied himself and became man, but you could go even farther now, could you? He started to die coming out of himself and he created the creation. Um, I think St. Gregory Palamas is the one in one another one of his sermons would say. Um, so, uh, you know, think about it. God knew that in creating the world, he knew, he foreknew that Adam and Eve would, what they would do. And he knew that what it would require of him in order to fix it and to finish his creation. But he went ahead anyway for the sake of those who would love him. And he did it because he looked down the centuries and he saw that the Theotokos, the virgin, would say yes. If she had said, if he knew she was going to say no, he wouldn't have created the world. Because how is he going to become man? How is he going to become flesh if the woman does not receive him? I've not heard that before, have you? This is the teaching of the church. And this is, the, you know, just to kind of uh, uh, caution you, this is what we mean. If you ever hear that we, uh, us referring to the Theotokos as co-creator, this is what we mean. It's by her yes that God, if you will, give him the permission to create the world according to his purpose, which was for him to become man so that we could become God. Yeah. And you would not force this. Okay, is that... Well, let's, so, so now let's start looking into the genealogy itself. You can look on the table of the genealogies. Now let's go, let's just kind of look at Let's see what, what differences can you pick out other than the fact that uh, Matthew begins uh, with, uh, who does he begin with? Uh, Abraham. So he begins with the most recent, with the, with, the, with the earliest. And Luke begins with the most recent. So beyond that, what other differences do you see in the two genealogies? You'll see that they go pretty much, well, okay, 
and you'll see that okay, the left hand column is Luke, right? The right hand column is Matthew. So you see that Matthew picks up with Abraham, which is the 22nd generation of Luke's genealogy. And then we go from Abraham, and we're pretty much, apart from the spelling, um, we're pretty much side by side um, until we come to David the king. And here's where the two genealogies diverge. <coughs> Matthew's genealogy traces the line back through Solomon, whereas Luke traces the genealogy back through Nathan. Not the prophet. This is a Nathan who was born, I think it says in Jerusalem, it's 2 Samuel 5.14, but it's also 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 5. I'll put it down. This is the son born of one of David's concubines. And you'll read about it in 2 Samuel 5 13, which you have on your table there, but also 1 Chronicles chapter 5. Oops, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 5, and chapter 14. And then from there, the lines go differently. Matthew, on the right, is now tracing the line. I'm sorry, I don't mean to get dizzy by going back and forth. I get it. Um, Matthew traces it through Solomon, and if you want to find the Old Testament references for this genealogy, you'll find it. Now we're going to do the red. Now we're going to do the red ink. And so the red ink would be 1 Chronicles chapter 3 verses 10 to 11 and then 12. So I guess verses 10 to 12. And that will take us down through on the right hand column Solomon, Rehoboam, Abiah, Isaac, Joseph, Jerome, Zeiss, um, on all the way to Jotham. And then you pick up, oh, okay, it keeps going, I'm sorry. It actually keeps going for We're still in 1 Chronicles chapter 3. And now we go to chapter or verse 13. And then you skip the seven, verses 17 through 19. And this will take us pretty much all the way down to, I believe, Zerubbabel, the 30th generation in Matthew's genealogy. So to make this simple, I mean, it must be much too complicated. The um, Old Testament uh, genealogy that is being used by Matthew for line for the 15th generation, very solemn, down through the 29th of Generation, ending with Zerubbabel, will be 1 Chronicles chapter 3, verses 10 through 19. Just make it simple. 10 through 19. Verses 10 through 19. That will take you down to Zerubbabel. And you'll see that at Zerubbabel, we're now in sync again with Luke who also uh, traces the line of Nathan down to Shealtiel, the 56th generation. You got that, and you got that, okay. Um, is that Travis? This is mine, okay. And then from Zerubbabel, it diverges again. So what's going on? Well, this is where it gets really complicated, and uh, it, you know you have to be a, you have to be a data person, I think, to enjoy this kind.
kind of thing, and you know, tracing all the data because it gets really intermixed. Um, but uh, it, it might be useful at this point to uh, turn to St. Gregory Balabas and uh, have him teach us for a few minutes here. <coughs> so let's go to St. Gregory Palamas. I have a slightly darker copy. <laughs> so I will read what yours says. And you do your best to follow it along. David indicates that our Lord Jesus Christ has no genealogy with regard to his divinity. Isaiah says the same, and later so does the Apostle. How can the descent be traced of him who is in the beginning and is with God and is God and is the Word and Son of God? He does not have a father who was before him, and he shares with his father, uh, with his father's name, which is above every name and all speech. For the most part, genealogies are traced back through different surnames, but there is no surname for God, and whatever may be said of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are one and do not differ in any respect. Now I'm on paragraph two. Impossible to recount is Christ's descent according to his divinity, but his ancestry according to his human nature can be traced. Since he was deigned to become son of man in order to save mankind, uh, was the offering, offspring of men. Since he who deigned to become son of man in order to, be, to save mankind was the offspring of men. And it is this genealogy of his that two of the evangelists, Matthew and Luke, recorded. But although Matthew, in the passage from his gospel read today, uh, that the sermon is being delivered on the Sunday of the forefathers, which was the su week before last Sunday, um, begins with those born first. He makes no mention of anyone before Abraham. So there's one difference between the two. Matthew goes back only to Abraham. Luke goes all the way back to God. Adam, the son of God. Um, he traces the line down from Abraham until he reaches Joseph, to whom by divine dispensation the virgin mother of God was betrothed, being of the same tribe and homeland as him. And her so that her own stock might be shown from this to be in any, in no way inferior. Luke, by contrast, begins not with the earliest forefathers, the forebearers, but the most recent, and working his way back from Joseph, the, 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 the betrothed. You notice that in the church, we do not call Joseph the husband of Mary, we call him the betrothed. Does not stop Abraham, not having included Abraham's predecessors. And he ends with Adam. And he lists God among Christ's human forebearers. Here's a very interesting point. Wishing to show, in my opinion, that from the beginning, man was not just a creation of God, but also a son in the spirit, which was given to him at the same time as his soul, through God's quickening breath. It was granted to him as a pledge that if waiting patiently for, this gets to your question, I think, Brad, that the incarnation was not plan B, it was plan A. This is what God, because man from the beginning was created as a son of God. It was granted him as a pledge that if waiting patiently for it, he kept the commandments, he would be able to share through the same spirit in a more perfect union with God, by which he would live forever with him and obtain immortality. This gets to your question, Michael. And obtain immortality. Um, so now, do you begin to make, does, does Genesis chapter 2 begin to make sense to you, right? Where God gives to Adam and Eve a test, a commandment. How can you show your love for God if there's nothing with which to show it? And so he gives, and it's St. Gregory, another holy father, he's in the 4th century, who says that whatever command the Lord gave to Adam didn't really matter. What, what mattered was that there was a commandment. Uh, so, that Ad, so that Adam could express his obedience to the Father, because obedience is the expression of love. You don't obey somebody you don't love. And of course, you can be coerced into it, but you're not doing it out of love. It's not real obedience. So does, that helps to make sense, then, of, of, of Genesis chapter 2. But the whole point of the testing at the tree was for Adam to, uh, how would you say, uh, you know, to, to show that he was a son. 
you know, so that he could become immortal. Well, he failed. So now it makes sense, you know, Christ coming begins to make more sense. And why he comes in the flesh. He comes as the new Adam. Um, and I pointed it out in my sermon, actually, that my the sermon last Sunday, the first time I'd seen it, and I was quite excited about it. I was hoping that somebody else would be excited about it too. You know that when you look at the formation of the first Adam, he was made without human hands. God was his heart. God is the one who formed him from the dust of the ground. And that's exactly what we see happening to Christ in the womb of the Virgin. He is spun from the pure blood of the Virgin, not from, not from a human seed. And he is made in the womb of the Virgin. He is, he is created, he is fashioned but without human hands. He is just like the first Adam. But now his life begins to make sense to him, why he became flesh. And so that as Adam, he could complete what Adam was meant to be. But how could he complete it? Well, he had to complete it through obedience. So, Brad, going back to your question now, you see again how the, uh, the pattern of obedience was, was placed in the beginning. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, devised later on. It was in the beginning so that the uh, purpose for which God created man could be completed. Um, so it was, it was not completed. So the Christ comes in the flesh, and he, as the new Adam, is obedient even to the point of death on the cross. Well, now you begin to see that the cross is the tree of learning good and evil. It's the same tree. So just as Adam was tested in front of that tree, so the new Adam is tested on that tree. See? And uh, when, so, I mean, you see, it just begins to fall into place. So now when the Lord says on the cross, he's on the cross, you understand? This, and he himself is the tree of life. But he's on the cross. He's affixed to the cross. He's nailed to the cross. Well, the cross is, you know, the tree of learning good and evil. It's you and me. It's our body and soul. So he's nailed to us. And he's being obedient even to the point of death on the cross. And what does he say on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. Now it's finished. And what happens? Man becomes God as God becomes completely and absolutely man. Even to the point of death. He becomes absolutely one with us. In our death. And in all the things that death carries, right? Depression, anger, despair. I mean, you list it. Loneliness. You, you list all the things that are of death. Forsakenness. He becomes one with us absolutely, precisely in that darkness. But he is the resurrection and the life, and he is the light of God. He's the light of God. This is the light of God, the uncreated light of God, who is shining in the darkness. He's the one who's going into the tomb. I mean, everything just begins to fall into place. Now you begin to understand why the sun was darkened when he's hanging on the cross. Guess what, Michael? That takes us back to Genesis 1.14. Would somebody like to go to Genesis 1.14? And see what the sun is all about. The sun, the stars, uh, the lights of the heavens, what they're all about, what their purpose is. That explains to us why the sun was darkened when Christ is on the cross, destroying death by his death, destroying our disobedience by his obedience, and renewing our nature. So, you know, yeah. but did, did somebody find it yet? Yeah, it's for science. For science. Science of what? Yeah. Keep going, keep going. Days and years. Uh, a sign of, um, well, a, a sign that Christ had, had died to redeem us from sin. In the Greek, I don't have it in front of me, and it wouldn't take long to look at it, but I won't take the time. Uh, the word is taros. Taros. Time. The seasons. I think that's the word that is being translated as seasons. And to signify the seasons. What? When Christ is, um, is about to be crucified, so I, I, I believe what he says is the kairos is at hand. At some point he says the kairos. What kairos? The kairos that Martin just mentioned. Well, I've always believed that God did that to get people's attention. He did what? Something to get people's attention. He did what to get their attention? Uh, 
block out the, sun, the eclipse. There was an eclipse to block out the sun. This was a way of kind of getting. There's much more than that, Martin. See now, it's much, 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 much more than that. Uh, he would get their attention if they had eyes to see. If they had eyes to see, they should have seen that. They should have looked at Drive and thought, well, he's the one that's making the sun go through dark. And then that should have taken them to Genesis 1.14. Who created the sun? Oh, God. The one who's on the cross. Yeah. He's the one who created the sun. For what purpose? To bear witness to him on the cross. Yes, Garrett. So is that why the centurion makes the comment that he does? I think so. And what's the comment that you have in mind? Uh, that he truly I don't know, to be honest, because he wasn't a Jew. I don't know that he knew the Old Testament scripture, so what he saw, I don't know. But uh, it's not, you know, it's not out of line with that. Uh, sure, this was the Son of God, but there, there are other liturgical texts. This, this notion of the sun darkening uh, at the Lord's death is very rich, especially in the church's liturgical prayers. In some liturgical prayers, the sun is darkened as though the sun is divesting itself, it's taking off its clothes, its light. Like you do at baptism. As though the sun is getting ready for baptism. In other liturgical prayers, it says that the sun was darkened. And then there's, I've run into a couple of liturgical prayers where it says explicitly that it was darkened because of the brilliance of Christ that was shining on the cross. Remember, he's the son of righteousness. Not S-O-N, but S-U-N. And so when he's on the cross, I mean, this is the theophany of all theophanies. And when he's on the cross, here is the light of God, the uncreated light of God, shining in the darkness. And he's shining so brilliantly that the sun can no longer see, be seen, just like when the sun comes out. You cannot see the stars or the moon or the moon in the sky. So it's, you know, all of these things, are, and it's bearing witness, it takes us, you know, so here we're in Pascha, and we're looking at the signs of nature, but this takes us back to Christmas. <coughs> Because how is Christ born witness to at Christmas? The star, you know? Um, what else? And, and, and in the Proto Evangelium of James, it says that uh, when, at the moment of Christ's birth, everything grew still. Still. The birds stopped singing. This is such a sacred moment. Oh, it's born. Um, well, okay. We'll start this off on that. Where were we? Um, um, yeah, I think it was that uh, with, with Christ, the tree of life is affixed to the tree of learning good and evil, the tree of creation. By his obedience, we have said before, obedience and death do not go together. So if God is obedient, God the Word, God the Son, is obedient to his father, even to the point of death on the cross. What's going to happen to not just to death, but to disobedience? And the shaft. Like old wine skins being uh, with new wine being poured into them. They're just going to burst. So this is the mystery that Christmas is looking ahead to. Right? The mystery of Pascha. You see at Christmas, you see Christ as a newborn babe. Uh, pointing towards the mystery of his being firstborn of the dead. You see him wrapped in swaddling clothes, as a, in his tomb he'll be wrapped with the linen cloth. You'll see them in a cave, as he'll be in the tomb, and Pascha. Everything at Christmas is pointing to Pascha. The tomb of the dead. Okay, I don't remember exactly where, why we started off on all that, so we'll just keep going here. Um, I have in, in your study guide what, online. Uh, yeah, it, this, this is all very rich, as you can imagine. So we don't. If we got caught up in it, we could we could go. We would never get through all of this. So let's go ahead and and and, uh, and uh, leave that particular flower garden, and let's go to the next one. Let's look at the question in line twelve. Let's start looking. You know. Um, why might genealogies be so important in the Bible? Have you ever asked that question of yourself? As you're reading Chronicles and, uh, let's see, which one is there? Oh, we didn't get the study guide yet. There you go. It makes me always, I always 
start to think about it, in the world, it's it's considered one of many creation stories, okay. Genesis. Okay. But at the same, but it's the only creation story that I know of that leads into this, that is history. Okay. You know, it's not fanciful gods and fans and okay. Go, go, okay. like turtles happening and all okay. this stuff. It's, okay. It starts with a man and it down, down, down. Yes. So, so it's a history. Yes. Of precisely who? Of Christ. Or of God. Be more, be more generic. I mean, where does Christ Oh, man. Israel. Israel, okay. Precisely, most precisely the, the history of Israel. Right. Now, um, St. Gregory Palamas makes this point, and you can read it in the sermon, if you can read it. Um, you, when you read this, these genealogies, you'll, you'll notice, that perhaps from your remembering that one time that you, you resolved to read the Bible all the way through, <laughs> and uh, you kept falling asleep at the point of all these genealogies, uh, you remember that there were a lot of genealogies, right? A lot of genealogies. So St. Gregory makes the point that uh, it's interesting how the biblical writers um, trace certain genealogies up to a point and then they just leave off. But then there's uh, one there's, there's, there's one genealogy, actually two genealogies, that they do not leave off. And those are the genealogies that have to do with, it's a question, certainly of Mary, the Virgin Mary. As you can see from Matthew and Luke, you can trace the genealogy of Christ all the way back to Abraham in Matthew, all the way back to Adam in Luke. And we can find the list of these genealogies, as I've indicated here, just beginning to indicate here, at different parts of the Old Testament. First Chronicles, uh, Samuel, I think you can find in some places in there. Uh, Genesis has some of, some of, some of these uh, genealogies. But you know, scattered throughout the Bible are these genealogies, and they all we put them to, they're all from the same line, and you put them together, as did Matthew and Luke, and they take you eventually to Christ. Now, uh, how does how do the fathers account for the differences in the genealogies between Matthew and Luke? Uh, well, um, one one is the genealogy of, of Anna, it says. The one, one father points out, I think it's uh, Nikolai Velomorovich. The one genealogy uh, is of, uh, is of Anna. She was descended from the tribe of Levi, or Aaron, so the priest Levi. And the other genealogy is uh, from Joachim, who was descended from King David. So that in uh, so that when the virgin was born, and the merging of these two lines, the priestly and the king, the royal line. Um, but you know, I've, I've seen other fathers, uh, uh, Saint Gregory Palamas being one of them who uh, references not Joachim and Anna, the, aunt, the parents of Mary, but rather he references Joseph and Mary. So that uh, the one genealogy is going, is, is going to Joseph, the other genealogy is going, uh, well, the other genealogy also actually goes to Joseph. But when you hit Joseph, the genealogy changes. Did you, when you've read it, have you noticed? Because uh, up till, till you get to the time of Joseph, the formula is always um, uh, whatever, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, or um, Solomon, born, which is a very interesting um, formula as well, uh, born of the wife of Urias. It does not say born of David, born of wife of Urias. You know, that's in Matthew's genealogy. Well, you know the story. Um, but when it gets to Joseph, it says, um, jo uh, Joseph, the son of so-and-so, who was betrothed to a vir the Virgin Mary, um, or who was um, considered by, by law, by Levitical law, to be the, the, uh, of whom it was supposed that the Lord that was the father of, Joseph, of, of Jesus. But it does not say that Joseph or uh, sire. It just says that he was the betrothed of the Virgin. And now we have the birth of Christ. Um, so the point being that uh, these genealogies, this genealogy, especially of Christ, goes all the way back to the beginning. But now to go back, going back to the question, why do you think the Bible, the Old Testament in particular, is so obsessed with genealogies? Now the New Testament is only concerned with Christ's genealogy. 
But why uh, with all of these genealogies? And who are these genealogies of? You know, where do they generally start? Go back in your mind and see if you can uh, remember the, where they start. And then just hold this as a question. Once again, as he said, it helps keep track of the histories of everyone. So it certainly does that. But there is a deeper reason that I can see. Right? David? I'm sorry, but this is never relevant. I was just wondering, after Jacob, why don't they mention Judah? Between all the brothers. Is it just... What? Yeah. Because guy. he's the one through, through, uh, to whom the line of Christ goes. So, okay. It was what? Judah, the son of Jacob, who is the forefather of Christ, not any of the other brothers. Oh, okay. That's what I was yeah, so, yeah, so all of these, uh, all of these uh, forebearers in the genealogies are tracing the line of Christ. No one else. Yeah. So you'll notice that uh, many of these names, uh, they might be second sons, not, not the seniors, not the oldest. Yeah, the two about the middle. Or uh, even there's the story of, um, there's the, the genealogy of Perez, where he, he was the son of, uh, of um, what does it say in Matthews? It says, um, was it Perez, who was born of Judah, of Tamar? Yeah, yeah that's it. Tamar was Judah's daughter in law. Um, and that's a that's a that's an interesting story, you know. Um, Judah had uh, he had a son that he betrothed to the to, to Tamar, but the son died before he could sire any children. So he was according to Levitical law, uh, so that in order for that son to uh, have progeny, uh, it was necessary for his brothers or one of his male kin to go into Tamar and to bear children for the deceased brother, for the deceased son. Well, Ur, the oldest, would not, uh, oh no, was it Onan? Oh, I can't remember the names now. Would not do it. Um, I think it was Bob. Was, no. Uh, sure, was it? Whatever. Um, it didn't work out. <laughs> I don't, I've read that, you know, that, that when you get into genealogies, I just kind of get glassy eyed I just cannot hold on. And no matter how many times I read it, I cannot hold on. Was this Onan the one that um, yes. spilled the seed on yes. the ground? Yes, yes. So he went into Tamar, but he would not. Because he knew that any child born of him would not be his. It would be his deceased brother. So he spilled the seed on the ground. Yeah. That was not pleasing to the Lord. Well, so Judah was going to uh, uh, ask Tamar to wait for his, 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 other, his other son. But the son was too young. And, and the son... Finally, did become of age, but Judah did not give her give him to her. So Tamar played the harlot, and she seduced Judah, her father-in-law, to go into her, and to and and he sired from his daughter-in-law, not knowing she was his daughter-in-law, Perez and Zerah, and it's Perez, or Fares, whatever, who is the forefather of Christ. And that's in the Matthew's genealogy. It's just. And these are the kinds of stories that you become run into when you check out the names of all these genealogies. But there's a deeper reason I want to get into. Um, let's, so let, let, I, I have these other questions on the study guide as kind of a close. Um, line number 16. What is the Old Testament all about? Oh, okay, well, that's a wide open question. Oh, no, there's that. What is the Old Testament all about? Um, can we say that it's about the Exodus? And it's about procuring and securing the promised land. That's what it's about. And in line with that, it's about what are the prophets all about? Line 18. What are the prophets all about? How to keep the law of God so that Israel will not be expelled from the promised land, like Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden. So now, why are the genealogies so important? The land, the promised land is also called what? The land, land of milk and honey. Milk and honey. <laughs> the land of inheritance. The land of inheritance. Who inherits it? The sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel. How are you going to determine that you're a son of Israel? And that to you belongs this portion of the land. You trace your genealogy to show that you come from one of 
the sons of Israel. Um, so that's why genealogies would be so important. In line number 22, what does the say about all the election and predestination? But we need to add, there, 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 we need to get to the purpose of these two questions in line 16 and 18. Um, you see then that the genealogies of the Bible are like this thread that connects each person back to his forefather as one of the sons of Israel and through the son of Israel back to Isaac back to Abraham and then all the way back in Luke's genealogy back to Luke from this what would you call it, the characteristic of the genealogy um, you begin to see what the Bible is all about, what is the Old Testament all about in these terms, you begin to see it's about, isn't it about um, who gets to be uh, an, an, an heir of the promised land? So um, this is the context of predestination, election in the Bible. It has nothing to do with God arbitrarily assigning salvation to you and not to you. It has everything to do with determining who becomes an heir in the, of the promised land. Um, now, how did they determine that the land was divided out? How would they determine which tribe got which portion? Do you remember? They threw lots determine who would get which portion. Um, so, if um, <coughs> so why would so um, yeah, so then how then would you become one of these elect? How would you become one of these elect so that you could inherit your portion in the land of Israel. What did you have to do? You have to show your genealogy. Okay, show your let's papers. say that you're not a Jew. Are you out of luck? Oh, no. You have to be within my group. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and if you were a male, what would you have to do? Marry him. Circumcised. Be circumcised. Be circumcised. So the elect would be anyone who was incorporated either by birth or by, how are we going to call it, by grafting in through circumcision, but both natural born and the foreign born had to be circumcised. And it was the right of circumcision that made you one of, a member of Israel and therefore one of the elect. So you see, you didn't have to be born as a Jew, but you had to become a Jew through circumcision or an Israelite. Now, what is our Circumcision. Every year. Baptism. Baptism. And so it's through baptism that you become one of the elect. But what must you do to be baptized? Do you see that to be baptized, nobody forces you to be baptized. And God doesn't go out and, I mean, it's not like all of a sudden you're zapped, right? <laughs> And you feel this, 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 pull, this pull, force pulling on you, even though you don't want to, pulling you to the church to be baptized. But a gentle nudges, but even gentle nudges, Travis, what do you have to do with those gentle nudges? You can resist them. You have to obey. You have to. But what is going to be? Are you forced to obey? Exactly, that's the point I'm getting to. You are baptized by your free will because you chose to be baptized. But when you chose to be baptized, and that is our circumcision, you became one of the elect. You became one of the predestined. What were you predestined for? 
you're predestined to inherit this promised land, which God had already mapped out. You know, he'd already mapped it out. This is Old Testament context so far, but now let's let's translate it into a New Testament context. If, if, if we now understand the importance of the genealogy and why it's important, well, several questions pop up. Why would Christ's genealogy be so important? Where does Christ come from? Let's go to Matthew's genealogy. Where does Matthew, where does Matthew trace Jesus' origin? No, he doesn't. Abraham. Abraham. That doesn't mean that God, Jesus did not come from God. Right. But for some reason, Matthew is focusing on Abraham as the beginning of Jesus' genealogy. He's doing theology here, you understand? He's doing theology. So we need to ask the question, what is the theology that Matthew is wanting to tell us? Um, what about Abraham? What about Abraham? Through your nation. Through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. So, what, so in that light, what is he saying about Jesus relative to Abraham? He's the seed. This is the seed through whom all nations will be blessed. What else about Abraham comes to mind? Faith. This is before Moses' law. So he's tracing the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Abraham, the father of Israel, and the father then of those who are of faith, as St. Paul would say. Well then, where does Jesus' genealogy begin? Even in the flesh, where does it begin? It begins in the faith of Abraham. It doesn't begin on some ethereal cloud, you know, not faith is some ethereal cloud, but it begins in faith as it was incarnate, if you will, in, the, in, the, in, in Abraham, in his, in, in his obedience. Um, so, go back. So, what about David? He says, "Son of God," or says, says, "Jesus Christ, Son of Abraham, Son of David." Why is he focusing on those two? What about David's traction relative to the mystery of Christ? I'm sorry. The great Yes, I know. Yes, he, he's the forefather of Christ, but why? There are many forefathers of Christ. Why is Matthew focusing on Abraham and David? It was after God's own heart. Okay, it was after God's own heart. Okay, it was after God's own heart, but let's go into the history of David. What about him? David's his kingship, history? maybe. What's that? His kingship. He's king. He's a king. And what does he say to David about his kingship? Have no end. It will have no end. Your kingdom will be forever. I will raise up from your loins a son, and he will sit on your throne. You will sit on the throne, and he will not, and I will never take it away from him. Um, so, Jesus then is shown to be the seed in whom all the nations, the seed of Abraham, in whom all the nations would be blessed. And he's also shown then to be the son of King David. Uh, this is the one who would would make David's kingdom to be eternal. So, um, if the purpose, though, of the genealogy is to verify that you are a son of Israel and that you are um, owed, for lack of a better word for now, um, an inheritance in the land of Israel, what then is the significance of Christ's genealogy? Because... Christ had no earthly children. Where does Jesus' genealogy begin? Well, we saw from Matthew, it begins in the mystery of faith, as exemplified by Abraham. Where does it begin in Luke? Yes. But before it go up, where does it, where did we get to before we get to go? Adam, the son of God. Um, where do you think then is this promised land that is in fact the real promised land that the Palestine is, all, is, is just a copy of? 
that is meant as, our, as the inheritance of those who are the children of Abraham and of David. And now we're going to St. Paul's argument. Who would be the true, who would, what would be that land? It would be Christ himself. Um, I referred a few to, uh, a couple weeks ago how in the Psalms the promised land is referred to all, the land of the living. So many places, the land of the living, or the land of the living one. And the Lord says to his prophet, to his, he says to the prophet Ezekiel, with regard to the priests, he says to them, I am your inheritance. Well, if you're a member of Christ, boy, what tribe do you belong to? You belong to the tribe of Judah, through his father, through his mother's father, Joachim. You belong to the tribe of Aaron, through his mother's mother. Uh, so you belong to the priestly and the and the uh, kingly lines, or uh, lines of, of Israel, and to uh, and to whatever portion of the promised land was given was to be given to them. Well, what was the part? What was uh, King David's portion? It would be the capital. I mean, Jerusalem and Judah. Um, Aaron's portion. I don't exactly remember what Aaron's portion was. But it was around the temple, was it not? Um, so, if if the land of our inheritance in Christ, I mean, do we have a land of inheritance in Christ? I mean, he had no earthly children. You follow what I'm trying to get at? That our inheritance, in fact, is not the land of Palestine. It is the kingdom of heaven. So, Jesus had no earthly children. But does he have no children? Where does this genealogy end? I mean, where does this genealogy that Matthew and Luke are tracing out, where does it end? It ends in Christ. And where does Christ end? In the tomb. In the tomb. Then how do you become a member of Christ's body? You must be circumcised. That is to say, you must be circumcised with the new circumcision, which is the cutting off the foreskin of the heart, which is baptism. Um, you must be, so you must be baptized. And again, so going back to our earlier point, you're baptized because you want to be. But that, that is the, that's the movement of faith. Faith is, is love. Faith is obedient because it wants to be. It, it wants to be out of love. And so then, this takes us, remember, to Ephesians that we were talking about the last time? Uh, chapter 1 in Ephesians, where he came across that word, bro, uh, read so. You know that, uh, that God has predestined you. In other words, he has mapped out your um, inheritance. He's mapped out your, your destiny beforehand, even before the foundation of the world. And what did we see where that was the horizon or the boundary of that land that God had mapped out, or had, you know, uh, uh, marked off? Do you remember what that boundary was? Do we need to go back to Ephesians? was Christ himself. Remember, we looked at Ephesians chapter 1 in light of, uh, or in connection with Genesis chapter 1. Remember what it says. He made such and such according to its kind. He made such and such according to its kind. But when we got to man, what does it say? He made man according to the image and likeness of God. In other words, the boundary, the horizon of all the animals and the plants was their own species, the creation itself. But the horizon, the definition of man was God himself, the image and likeness of God. So that the, the land, you know, the, the land that the, old, that, that, that the uh, old Testament really is all about is not Palestine. Palestine is just a copy of the real land. This is the heavenly pattern that Moses saw on the mountain. And the real land is Christ himself, or the mystery of the Holy Trinity. That's the boundary. So uh, if you have been um, elected, what does that mean? It means that you've been baptized. And that you have chosen by faith to be united with Christ. <coughs> And now we are setting out on an exodus for the promised land, the land of our inheritance, 
which is no less than Christ himself, in the Father and the Holy Spirit. I want to look at uh, Peter, Second like Peter. Okay, it's Second Peter. So I want to show this phrase to you, but it might be puzzling. And when you look at it for the first time, or when you read it in English. Um, Simon, 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those whose faith, um, what does it say, is equal in honor to ours. Um, what's the verb? I'm missing a verb. I can never remember what that verb means. Somebody read it for me. Whose faith. First Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Slave and apostle of Jesus Christ to those having received a faith equal to ours. Okay. Means, uh, the justification, the righteousness. Okay. Well, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, this isn't saying what I expected it to say. I must be thinking of another passage, so we'll have to leave that off another time. Actually, no, I think this verb, la punsen, or to, that it's translated received, I think it means, yeah, that's what the deal is. This verb means to receive by lot, or by casting lots. So it's the faith that you have received by the casting of lots. But you see, that's Exodus language. That's promised land language. You have received a faith that, in other words, you have been given a portion, a part of Christ, in Christ, through the, you know, through the casting of lots. In other words, uh, this, is not, this is not to say that you, are, you have been arbitrarily chosen to be a member of Christ. It's saying that you are a member, but where you, exactly what portion you're going to have is assigned to you by the mystery of God's grace. If you want it, that's what it's saying. So this is, th th this is the theology you know, that, get, that, that we get into when we go into the, uh, in the, the, the uh, genealogy of Christ. Um, well, I don't know, I think that maybe we have kind of covered in one way or another all the questions here. Let's maybe look at uh, line 27. If one is a descendant of Christ, the portion of the land belongs to him as one of the elect of Israel. How does one become a descendant of Christ the King, and thereby one of the elect of Israel? And if one is grafted into Christ's genealogy, where does, where does his ancestry begin? There's a bunch of questions there. How does one become a descendant of Christ? Baptism. Um, and if one is grafted into Christ's genealogy, where does his ancestry begin? God. Yes. Abraham. Yes. Yes. Abraham. David. Christ's genealogy becomes our genealogy. That is our family line. <laughs> and so, because we are descended now from Christ and his ancestors, we are now the descendants of Christ and the children of God. To us is given the land land of inheritance is ours, if one. And now that's what we are, that's what we are journeying to. Like Israel, the elect of God, uh, is delivered from the slavery in Egypt, through the Red Sea, and when they get out on the other side, Pharaoh and all of his armies, they're gone. There's your image of baptism. That's what happens in our baptism. It's all washed away. But you get up on the other side and you look towards the promised land and what do you see? What do you see in wilderness. You have to kind of go through the wilderness. When Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, he is, comes out of the waters and uh, this glorious experience, you know, the Father bears witness to him as his son, the Spirit descends upon him and bears witness to him as the anointed of God, the, the king of Israel, the king of all creation even. And where does Christ go from there? 
led by the Spirit, he goes to the wilderness. For what purpose? Tempted. To be tested by the devil. And where does that testing end? To the temple. It ends in the temple, but even there it doesn't end. Because remember, he goes from the temple on Palm Sunday. Where does he go from there? He eventually goes to Golda. Yeah. And to the tomb. So that's the journey that we're going to make. Anybody who follows Christ. It's that journey that we have to make. You see the purpose of that journey now. It's to test us. We have become children of God. Do you want to be a child of God? A child of God is one who loves God. Well, I don't love God. Well, that's the first thing we need to acknowledge. I don't love God, but I do want to love God. Um, I've got all kinds of nonsense going on in me that keeps me down. I don't want that nonsense to be in me. Well, okay, then follow Christ, but that means following Christ and like Israelites are led through the wilderness by the cloud by day and the fire of the fiery pillar by night, which is the image of Christ and His Holy Spirit, even His Holy Mother. And as they are fed in the wilderness with the manna that comes from heaven, as they are delivered so many times from their, from their enemies and from all kinds of calamities by God, by miracle, uh, miracles and signs and wonders. So also, if we're going to follow Christ through our, the wilderness of our life, so also we can count on Him to help us make it to the promised land. If we will but cling to Him, you know, and not give up and decide, Oh, I'm going to go back to Egypt. <laughs> or sit at the golden calf there. So you see how the genealogy of Christ, it begins to open up really to the whole theology of the Bible and begins to explain the whole Bible and the theology, the, the theology of salvation, the, the theology of ascetic discipline, the theology of taking up a cross. And I want to close just with this one Last thing, I want to make sure that we get this out before we leave. And that is going back to Matthew's genealogy. It says, Jesus Christ, this is the genealogy or the Genesis, the book of the Genesis of Jesus Christ, uh, son of Abraham, son of David. Abraham begot Isaac. There's a whole bunch of theology right there. Is that Matthew right here? Matthew chapter, that's on the right hand column. Yes. Tell me about Isaac real quick. What's the big deal about Isaac? Well, okay, but <laughs> yes, he was. But I'm thinking even how he even came into being. I mean, he was born. Son of promise. He was a son of yes, a son of promise. He was. He was uh, what, what was the deal with Sarah and Abraham? Sarah was Sarah. And what does Saint Paul say about? Them? Yeah, as good as dead. They were as good as dead. <laughs> so then, if Isaac is is a born of, of Sarah, what is that an image of? Christ. Yes, but, go on, the resurrection. Oh. The resurrection of Christ. So you see then that the whole of Israel begins with the faith of Abraham, which leads to the, an image of the resurrection. Israel as a nation is a prophecy of the resurrection of Christ, the seed of Abraham. All, of all the nations of the earth will be blessed. How would they be blessed? By the seed of Abraham all the nations. Because he would conquer not just the people so that we could take their land, he conquered the evil one, he conquered the kingdom of death so that we could take heaven. Anyone who wants to become one of the elect by taking up their cross, uniting themselves to Christ and the mystery of baptism, and then beginning to make their way through the wilderness to the promised land with the grace and the help of the Lord and His Holy Lord. So, we'll conclude with that, okay? So, you know, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may you enjoy a blessed Christmas. And think about these things. And honestly, I mean, the more I think about these things, the more I sort of regret that when we were, our kids were growing up, we'd spend Christmas Eve reciting um, the night before Christmas. Which is fun. Honestly, it was fun. Oh my gosh, it doesn't even compare to the beauty of the Christmas story of the Bible. So, you know, let's see what we can do to make Christmas real for us and for our children.
Um, let's see, before we leave, if those of you who are able to stay for a few minutes, I would like to get this set up for the Holy Supper on Friday afternoon. To which all of you are invited, of course. I think most all of you are signed up. But if you're not signed up, just come. Um, it's not going to be a feast of ham and, and eggs. <laughs> and all be lent in dishes. But they're tasty. And it's a nice way for us to get together uh, after the service on the, in the afternoon. That's the feast for the next day. On Christmas Day, boy, are we going to feast. But who is the green eggs in <laughs> I think by then we don't care. <laughs> so, let's say a prayer to the fifth focus. And those of you can stay, just take a few minutes. We'll be arranged the tables. Really, just meet to bless you with that hope, and bless them most here. And the mother of our God, who honor hold on the cherubim, and our glorious God, we pray that the seraph. Without corruption, this thou be birth, the world of the world, and the world of the world. Christ is in our midst. He is in our shall be.